A School of Her Own by Arletta Richardson Chapter 13 An Unexpected Holiday Elizabeth jumped down from the sleigh and ran to meet Len. Oh, thank you, she exclaimed. That was so nice of you to do that for me. Len looked surprised. It was no trouble at all, he said. You're welcome. She followed him around to his side of the sleigh. You will help me back up, won't you? She purred. And before I was fully aware of what had happened, I found myself moving over again to make room for Elizabeth in the middle. It was as neat a piece of maneuvering as I had ever witnessed. Len tucked the robe in around us and we turned toward home. She chattered lightheartedly the whole way and seemed to have forgotten that I was there, for she never looked in my direction. The few times in my life before that I had been threatened, I had regarded it as a challenge. This situation was decidedly more complex. Looking back to my visit with Mrs. Lawton, I remember that she too had hinted at the fact that I had been responsible for her husband's frequent visits to the school. Now his daughter declared that because of me he had been forced to leave home. If Elizabeth conveyed this information to Len, what would he think of me? Would I lose my job? The longer I thought about it, the more muddled my mind became and the further I seemed to be from a solution. By the time the sleigh stopped at the Lawton's road and Len got down to walk Elizabeth to the house, my head was aching, and I was seriously considering resigning my school and going home to Ma. Len returned at once and we proceeded toward home. You've been awfully quiet, he said to me. I don't think you said anything all the way back. I'm fine. I just have a lot of things on my mind. Len nodded. I hope that you're not still worried about Abe. You'll likely have more children with broken bones before the year ends. This was the opening I had waited for to tell Len about Cy Lawton, but I found I couldn't do it. Any investigation of the matter would inevitably lead to the information about Mr. Lawton's visits to the school. As far as I knew, Elsie was the only child aware of the situation, and that only because she had walked into the room while he was there and had observed him lurking about the school grounds. Silently, I thanked the Lord that she was not a gabby child. The following day was cold and crisp. Miss O'Dell, the twins announced loudly. We walked right on top of the fence this morning, and we didn't even go through the snow. They had arrived breathless with Mary and Romani between them. All three had bright red cheeks and cold noses. No one waited outside on these frigid mornings, but came directly to the stove upon arrival. I helped the girls remove their scarves and boots and settled them with blocks until time for school to begin. George Elliot carried in more wood for the fire, but in spite of our best efforts, the room was bitter cold if one sat more than ten feet from the stove. The older children in the back of the room kept their coats on and blew on their fingers to warm them. Look, Miss O'Dell, Nancy said. Marianne has gone to sleep. I glanced over at the little girl whose desk was nearest the stove. Her head was down on her arms, and she slept peacefully. That's all right, I said. Let her rest. The walk in the cold tired her out. At least she's warm. When it was time for dinner and Marianne had not stirred, I went to waken her. As soon as I touched her face, I knew I should have checked sooner. She was burning hot, much warmer than her nearness to the stove would warrant. I shook her gently and she opened her eyes. Do you want some dinner? I asked her. She shook her head. My throat hurts. I picked her up and went back to my desk. While I ate, I held her. She put her head on my shoulder and went to sleep again. She's breaking out in a rash, Miss O'Dell, Prudence Edwards commented as she stood watching us. Do you suppose she has the measles? Oh dear, I hope not. The whole school is likely to get them. She should be at home, though. I'll take her. Elsie volunteered. It isn't very far. I was grateful, and while I dressed Marianne for the outdoors, Elsie got ready to go. As an added protection, I wrapped my scarf around Marianne's head and shoulders. 
I stood at the door and watched as the girls crossed the schoolyard and started toward the Romani's wagon home. We began the afternoon work reluctantly. If anything, it was colder in the room than it had been in the morning. Why is it so cold in here? Why is it so cold in here? Jamie complained. We need a stove in every corner. That wouldn't help, Julianne told him. I'm right by the stove and my feet are frozen. The heat all goes to the ceiling and we're not up there. I know it isn't comfortable, I said. Finish the lessons you're doing now and we'll go home early. I was sure the temperature was dropping even as we sat there. It would soon be impossible to work. Elsie returned and a gust of icy wind followed her into the room. The children made a space for her next to the stove. I had to carry Marianne part of the way, she reported. She never would have made it home by herself. I told Mrs. Romani I thought Marianne had the measles, but I don't know if she understood me or not. Thank you, Elsie, I said. I appreciate your taking her home. I'll get word to Mrs. Abbott to look in on her later. I soon decided to send unfinished work home with the children and close the school. When they had all left, I banked the fire, checked the windows, and picked up my books and papers. Elsie had waited, as she usually did, to walk with me. Mr. Lawton is back, she said as we started out. I saw him in the woods when I took Marianne home. Are you sure, Elsie? I asked her. Carrie said this morning that he hadn't come home yet. Elsie nodded. It was Mr. Lawton, all right. My heart sank. The children certainly must have been happier when he was gone. At least I was sure that Abe was. My conscience told me that I had no right to make a judgment, but I knew that I was happier when Cy Lawton was not in the vicinity. Perhaps he had come to see how things were at home and would leave again soon. My black thoughts vanished when I opened the door at home. There at the table with Alice sat Sarah Jane. I dropped my books and hugged her. What are you doing here in the middle of the week? The stove at my school is broken down and needs to be repaired, she explained. No heat, no school. What are you doing here in the middle of the afternoon? Same thing, I laughed. The stove isn't broken, but it wasn't heating the room either. Oh, it's good to see you. Can you stay the rest of the week? Sarah Jane nodded happily, and all of us settled down to visit and enjoy the unexpected holiday. Mrs. Williams lit the lamps against the early darkness, and when Len and Mr. Williams came in shortly before supper time, I realized that I had not once thought about the things that were disturbing me. I don't suppose you ladies noticed what's going on outside, did you? asked Mr. Williams. I'm glad you closed the school, Mabel. There's a sleet storm starting, and unless I miss my guess, we're in for a spell of snappy weather. I think we'll send word that there will be no more school this week. And even though the temperature remained below freezing, it was exhilarating to be outside. We arrived at church to find a group of ladies huddled about the stove. Augusta Harris's voice carried easily to the back of the building. I warned them that something like this would happen. Now that's certainly not fair, Augusta. Mrs. Matthews spoke up. There was no way she could have known. Mph, of course not, Augusta replied. I told them a mere slip of a girl wouldn't have sense enough to run a school. Sarah Jane poked me. Sounds like you're the center of attention again, Mabel. What did you do this time? The ladies turned and saw us, and Augusta blushed. She was not going to be silenced, though. Well, I suppose you ladies have heard the news. No, Augusta, apparently we haven't. What is it? That little gypsy girl has scarlet fever, and thanks to Miss Odell, Elsie Matthews will probably get it too. Someone with a little common experience wouldn't have let a young girl take care of a child. Mrs. Matthews came quickly and put her arms around me. Now you don't pay any mind to Augusta, she said. There is not one of us that would have known that little girl had scarlet fever. You did right to send her home. I sat down heavily in the nearest seat. Scarlet fever? We had all been exposed. I pictured the children huddled together around the stove and Mary Ann sleeping on my lap. I remembered that Elsie had carried the child part of the way home. Oh, I'm sorry, I said. What can I do? There's nothing to do, 
Mrs. Williams declared briskly. This isn't the first time there's been scarlet fever in the community, and it won't be the last. We'll simply ask the Lord to heal and protect. Len, Alice, and I took Sarah Jane back to her boarding place that afternoon. We talked happily about other things, but underneath lay the dread that there might be an epidemic in the school. Sarah Jane squeezed my hand as we prepared to leave. Worrying won't keep it from happening, she said. I think the Lord wants us to handle things as they come up, not beforehand. Sarah Jane, do you feel about ten years older than you did when school started? Oh, at least. I'm serious, I said. I've never had so many problems all at once. I don't get one solve before the next one pops up. That's one of the hazards of being on your own, she told me. We can't get our folks to set things right anymore. We have to depend on the Lord and ourselves. Things will turn out just the way they're supposed to, Mabel. Soon you'll be looking back at this year and wondering what the fuss was all about. End of chapter 13